to tonight uh, at Meet Musician Podcast to be speaking to Scottish singer, multi-instrumentalist and broadcaster, Julie Fowlis. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Hey, you're very welcome. Now, you grew up in North Uist, in the Outer Hebrides. I did. Was it a childhood surrounded by music and song? Um, I suppose it was. Um, and not in any sort of romantic way, but there was, there was music everywhere and... Um, Gaelic song in particular was very strong and the piping tradition also so um, I, looking back I, I was very very fortunate to um, I, you know it really was in my formative years that um, really influenced what I do now so but was it just Gaelic or was it bilingual household or totally bilingual household and actually mostly English in the house to be honest my mother is a, a native speaker my father is not um, so it was mostly English in the house but one side of our family are all native speakers, so the, there was always conversations going on and there'd be back and forth between the two languages. And I, I think when I was younger, you know, like my granny would always speak in, to me in Gaelic and I would answer in English. So it was only really as an adult that I had to make a serious effort to actually improve my skills and just, and just use it, yes. use the language properly. Uh, one of my questions really was, my father was a Gaelic speaker, mm -hmm. presented the mod, etc etc but was of the generation where he felt that Gaelic was a dying language and never instructed any of his kids in how to speak other than a dog called Julius and a cat called Bria <laughs> we didn't really have any Gaelic in the house and no. he really felt it was a not worth the effort was it do you think something in the 80s and 90s that really kick-started an interest in keeping the language alive and keeping the, the heritage of Gaelic alive well I think so I think um, you know Many, many years of um, being very badly treated. The language has suffered for so long. I think it's kind of almost ingrained in people's psyche now. Um, and it, it's, well, at that point it was. And even my mother's generation were, that was the generation who went to school and who were still um, uh, chastised for speaking Gaelic and who were right. given the cane for speaking Gaelic. So there's definitely something that's ingrained in you it, about its worth and its value, I think. Um, and I, I'm proud now that I speak Gaelic to my own children and it's their first language. And, uh, you know, it's no big deal. There's lots of other people doing it. Uh, you know, I'm not a pioneer or anything, but I think no. it's just important that if you have it, that you use it. Exactly. So, I mean, you're part of, I'm going to get this pronunciation, Chobar and Jolkis? Chobar and Jolkis, yeah. I was close, I was you're close. close. Kiss to riches. Um, yeah. That's something, you're Gaelic artist in residence for that. Yes, and that I was. Is a, determined effort to keep an archive available to... Yeah, it's basically, it's a brilliant, um, one of the most ambitious and um, forward-thinking digital archive projects in the whole of Europe, if not the world, right. um, that set out several years ago to, um, to record... Well, actually, the recordings were made from the thir late 30s onwards, um, and the idea of Topan Dolokish was to um, take th the three different collections, which are um, the collection of John Lauren Campbell um, in Cana, the National Trust, um, some of the BBC archival recordings and the School of Scottish Studies in the University of Edinburgh to take these three collections and um, digitise the material from right. the old tapes and um, make them, uh, you know, catalogue them properly and then upload them to the website so that they're available free for anyone around the world to see and there are something like 40,000 items nearly now up online. Wow. Now somebody was asking me earlier on, I can't see him in the words down here, he was asking about DVDs, would you ever do or is there available already a DVD that could be sent to schools around the world? You know, or these would recordings? You, well, of these recordings or of a history of these recordings and how it came to be. Um, there's not so much a DVD, but there are CDs that Topol and Dulakish have made of certain projects. And also the School of Scottish Studies have released several CDs over the years, themed CDs, maybe songs from Uist or from Lewis or walking songs, things like that. And they're all available and an amazing resource. Yeah. Do you find, now it's a strange thing, that Gaelic is spoken by how many people worldwide? Um, around 60-something 60 60 thousand, thousand right, okay. about 1% of the population, just over. Do you get asked a lot, oh, how do people understand what you're singing about? Which they would maybe not ask if they were listening to African music or French music. Why is it you think people ask, oh, Gaelic? Is it, is it because it seems like, you know, such a small amount that you get asked quite often, how do people understand you? What do they connect with in the music? I, th I think the most questioning I get about Gaelic is here. Right. When, we, when I go away, uh, you know, and play in America or in France or Spain, nobody just, nobody questions it. They just... 
they enjoy it, Except or they don't. They just they either come and they, they enjoy the concert for what it is, um, and they don't really question the language element. They so it's a purely uh, parochial yeah, British, I, Scottish thing? Or? Um, I don't know. I think th there's a, there is a bit of that. Um, I think w we live in a society which is dominated by English language, and uh, I think there's perhaps, a, if I dare say it, a slightly healthier approach to bilingualism and maybe in the continent, yes. things like that. So yes, I, that's very true, very true. Perhaps. So, back to the music. Um, you're part of the group's Dochus Brolin. Oh, that's part of the... Amoebus. Dochus, actually, Dochus. are actually, we're trying to get back together again. Right. Yes, well, we're actually never separated, but we uh, all in, did other in things. In hiatus, as it were. Well, oh, we all grew up and got married and, you know, did things like that. And one of the girls went off to America. We lost her to another band called oh. Cherish the Ladies. And um, so she's always in America. It's very hard to rehearse with someone who's in New York. Yes. Uh, so, but actually, we're trying to get some material together this year. Maybe okay. try and record something if we can. We need a few babysitters, but we'll... Yes, <laughs> Linda, yes, exactly. Yeah. But your first solo album... Mm -hmm. As My Heart Is was yes. 2005. Was that a scary prospect leaving a band and going it alone or was it um, quite a comfortable process? It wasn't really a scary prospect because I didn't really plan to do anything with it right. or I didn't really plan to perform it solo sort of thing. I just kind of wanted to do this project. Um, it was recording songs that I had learned and that I had enjoyed and um, I didn't really see it going any further than that. Um, but. It, did. But it did. Yeah. And you got some great support from people like Mark Radcliffe and Jules yes. Holland. You did a Yeah, live we did. Show. After our second album, we played in Jules Holland. And um, it's funny how people always go back to that. Um, it was actually it was seven years ago now we did that. <laughs> and no, no, I, I just mean it's, I think people hold it up as something really important, even now, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's such a great history, and it's, it was a real honour to be to be part of it all. Well, it you is. Know? I mean, personally, it's some places where you hear music for the very first time, Absolutely. and you go, "Oh, I would never think to yeah. be interested in something like that." I mean, was it a stepping stone for yourselves, or was it? Oh, it, oh, it was. It, re it really was. And when I look back, you know, we shared the stage with like Joe and Armour trading and acts like that. You know, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, you know? exactly. That's not a bad, <laughs> not a bad roster. No. Um, now, 2012. I think I remember it. You think you know what's going to be coming here was a big year in the fact that Disney Pixar yes. made a film called Brave. Now, you oh, probably yes. ask this all the time. Mm -hmm. How did that come about and how did you get involved? I got an email from the um, assistant head of music for Disney Pixar uh, asking if he could have my phone number. So I gave it to him. Right. Yes. <laughs> As you would. Yeah. And then he phoned and said, we're making this film and we've listened to lots of singers and lots of music and we'd really like you to, to be kind of the, the, the lead voice on these songs. And um, would you like to come out to the Pixar studios and meet us? And I said, yes, please, that would be nice. Um, and we were going to be in America at the time, but unfortunately our, our, um, our schedule wouldn't allow us to nip out to see them. And so they actually came to, to Glasgow and we met here for the first time and talked through the film of what they kind of wanted to do and introduced us to the characters that are now so ingrained you know, with us all, Merida and, and the whole family. And we, um, it just kind of started from there. And we recorded the tracks, um, I suppose, at the beginning of the year in 2012. And uh, the film was out in the June, so. So was it part something you were given the song, Sing This, or was it something you had creative control over? Well, actually, I was really surprised at how much creative control they did did give us. You know, the songs were uh, written by a great man called Alex Mandel. Um, one of them was co-written by um, the, the director as well, uh, Mark Andrews. Um, so they had a very specific and definite vision for the songs. They were supposed to represent um, the protagonist of the film, Merida, her thoughts and feelings. So the points, like, I guess the, the aim of the song was very specific, but in terms of the music, they really welcomed kind of creative input and um, it was a really, honestly, a really enjoyable experience. And, and presumably some major brownie points with your daughters in years to come. Yes, well, it'll be cool for a while and then it will be very uncool. Yeah, like yeah, after. I suppose, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. yeah before all. Um, and that led to the Ryder Cup uh, handover I gig, was yeah. it? And that was a big audience you had for that. 500 million, I yeah, think. Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? That's not bad. Was that nerve wracking or did, um, is that something you just can't take into consideration? Well. Yeah, I think that whole year actually was, it was kind of a mad year with all these amazing um, 
things like you know going to Hollywood and getting to go to the premiere and playing the Ryder Cup and well not playing the Ryder Cup my golf's not that good but um, <laughs> playing at the closing ceremony but throughout that year I mean I had my second child in April of that year so to be honest um, most of the time I was in this kind of you know mad early days of baby mode and just focusing on you know, feeding this small, lovely, beautiful creature yes. and making sure her nappies were changed. So it's a good grounding, you I know. Was, yes, that would bring you back to Earth yes. with a bump, really. So, yeah. yes. And do you consider yourself now a kind of an ambassador for Scotland? Or is that putting no. it too grandly? No, but, no. no. Well, no, I was no. asked earlier on, you always look stunning. Simon down here asked earlier on, oh, you thing, always look amazing. Who designed your clothes? Is it something you do yourself or is it, do you have, well, a Simon, Simon noted that, did you not, sir? <laughs> Well, I was, last year I was very lucky. Um, uh, when we did the Brave thing and we were going to Hollywood, um, I got working with an amazing designer called Sandra Muddy, um, who happens to live just down the road from me. She's a Gaelic speaker, she's from Lewis, and we got on very, very well. And she's um, an amazing designer. So she designed a, the frock that I wore for the, for the premieres, well, like a few different frocks. Mm. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I managed to sneak a few things out of her wardrobe and borrow them of late, which is very, very nice and very useful. And yeah, she designed this. Um, but uh, mostly I'm just kind of, I, I don't really, I think with two kids, you don't really get to think about it very much anymore. So high street and just try and be as presentable as possible. It has been noted, it has been noted. Yeah. Um, so over the years you've collaborated and been asked to guest with other musicians. I mean, who have you worked with who's been your heroes that you've thought, wow, I can't believe this is happening? Um, well, I suppose I've done, some really interesting collaborations. One of the most interesting collaborations was um, my very good friend John McCusker's Under One Sky project, which brought together people like um, Graham Coxon of Blur, right. and who, you know, obviously I'd never met until we worked in that project, with great English singers like John Tams, I, just an amazing voice, and friends of mine like Ian MacDonald, a great piper, who mm. influenced a lot of my playing I, and taught me a lot um, over the years. And it was amazing to work, to bring all these characters together and put them in a room and rehearse and then bring it all to the stage. Things like that have been really good. But I mean, I've been so lucky to work with different people. I mean, even last week, I um, was collaborating with Nicola Benedetti. Yes. So she's recording a new uh, album, um, which we contributed a few songs to. And so that was very lovely and uh, just a lovely creative process. And are you at a stage in your career where you can phone up people and say, do you want to come and work with me? Is it? Does it go both ways now? I, I don't know. I mean, when we did the new album last year, when we were recording it, I suppose what I wanted to do was work with some of my closest friends and some of the musicians that I admire the most. And I'm very lucky to get to tour with them most of the time. So, right. um, and we brought in other friends and colleagues, like the Rant, Rant Fiddlers, four girls who are great friends of mine and um, who have got a lovely project on the go now where they use four fiddles without any accompaniment. They are the melody and the accompaniment and the harmony wow. and everything. So they, they guessed on the album and it was a, it was a really uh, satisfying and just a really happy experience actually. Yeah. Kind of and, and anybody that you think one day the ultimate would be that you could work with? The ultimate? Um, <laughs> I don't know actually. I don't know. I'll let that one stew. Most of, most of, I have to say, most of the people that I admire the most uh, are singers that I know, right. you know, and that like, great tradition bearers from the islands and from the highlands. And I, those people are the ones that I, I look up to the most, that I learn the most from. And it's just a small community that I get to, to see them and, and work with them and learn from them quite a lot of the time, actually. Yes. Well, that's, a, that's not a bad situation yeah. to be in. Yeah. Um, the fourth CD. Every Story yes. is out next month, February 24th. the 24th, but you can pre-order now. Um, has that been an interesting process now you have a young family? Has it been a different process from the yes. other CDs? Yes, um, it was very interesting. Um, and it actually, it shaped the way that we recorded this record. So rather than holding ourselves up in a studio um, for a week or a couple of weeks, what we did was we brought the studio to us, to our home. Right. And that meant that my children could be in their own beds every night and they would be happy at home whilst we were busy recording and things. And um, it kind of lent a really, made the whole experience quite relaxed. I knew that they were fine. They were in the, you know, just in the next room sort of thing. And I could kind of keep an ear out and an eye out for them. And for example, on the first day of the recording, we managed to get one song down and then we moved on to the second song. 
and it was going really well and it was just that time of the evening when the, the kids were going to go to bed and the youngest one who was just about a year and a half at the time she wouldn't settle without her mum so um, the recording had, it was going really really well and it was at that point where if I go it's probably not going to it's all going to fall apart so I just grabbed her and put her in a baby carrier and, and uh, just carried on singing and uh, hoped the microphone didn't pick up her snoring when she fell asleep. <laughs> so, so one of the tracks in the album is, is entirely, she, she's actually in the background there somewhere. So. That's lovely, very <laughs> nice. Well, I'm gonna open the floor up now for any questions. I believe there's possibly staff with microphones. Gary's the man there, he's gonna run round. If you just hang on one second until Gary gets to you. Run, Gary, run. That's it, he's gonna find you and ask your question. Hi. Hi. Um, you did a, a commission called Heskir? Heskir, yes. yeah. Um, have you ever thought of having it on a DVD and, and sending that to the schools in the Highlands and Islands so the kids would know what the real history is like? Yeah, actually, it would, it would be... We've always kind of wanted to do something with that. Um, we, we spent so much time filming, and some of the filming that we that we got was just, it was, the footage was amazing. And uh, I think it always helps tell a story when you have the picture there too. Um, so it would be nice to do something with that at some point, but it's, uh, it, it just usually always comes down to time and what you can manage to fit into a day and a week and a month. Uh, and between everything that's going on and touring, we've just not managed to quite get there yet, but we'd really like to do something with it at some point, yeah. yeah. Any more questions about that? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, we've seen you, many of us have seen you on stage with many, many different formations of bands. And I wonder, I think the most, the one that you looked most bemused in was fronting Bagad Kemper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, I'm trying to remember what year that was. It was maybe 2006 or seven or something like that. I can't remember. But um, we went out to um, a gorgeous festival in um, in Brittany, and we got to play with this um, lovely band called uh, Bagad Camper, and um, I can't remember how many pipers there were, but a lot, maybe like 30 pipers and bombard players, and the, we had sent some songs in advance, and they arranged uh, some of our songs for 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 the for the band. And they also sent, in return, one of their songs, a Breton song, which we translated to Gaelic and then kind of rearranged with them all together. And uh, it was uh, an amazing performance and a great opportunity to, 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 you know, to, to sing with them. They were, I love the melodies of Brittany. The melodies are beautiful. And although they were very different to our melodies, I often think when we did that exercise of translating their song in, in Breton into Gaelic, Although the melodies were very different, the, the sentiments of the song were the same. And I guess that's just folk culture. You, you'll find the same sentiments and songs all over the world. Yeah. Has everybody heard Bagad Kemper? It's quite a sound to behold. It's yeah. amazing. Any other questions on the floor? Uh, up there. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, Artus, we may I can kill Kiara Marair, August Vesha, fear all in the Hunra will turn her jas agat, hug a holy mori done gaelica, Augustan Gaelic, and Halibun, or food in a crinia. Is Garamanak Misha, Ach, Dolome, and Gaelica Gutapi, Agus, um, V. Dokyolsa, Agus and Kyol, Yen and Dinamar, Murinic Gaulif, no, no, mm -hmm. Kyol Tori, Illa, on Luofordum. Oh, Agus, uh, we're showing Kaist, uh, at Hagam, Cut the Hapentu Fuins, Stodge, Nagalic, and Halibun, Agus, um, Agus Sanorab. And will Egla Art not will to announce the Hyanga Usaj in the taxi here in Lasku? No, not will not make an ungodly bio mar marchanga kinder? Well, in all of them? Well, she's Jew Hist, Jew Hist, I guess, ha ha midrigal a me and stats in a garlic, and a toy, ha ha tor a teen. Tron the system ur mar gabhaig a fhuilbhim um, travian a gaelic mar eis impleith. Agus a sin go ma fhaalain, ha na haadaf na dool suas, uh, ha ni nacob sa na scol, um, an a scol gaelic an inner nish, agus ha ti nuclea vaa. Um, agus sirut ma a sin, ach, e ca nuna um, ha mi moachal, ca vil na siantúnia, e ca vil biaschas de chanan, ha 
had to fall off like Sashin Gangal, I guess Marshin Hagan and Agarach, I guess Fabish Nivi, Gama Fichloch, Iset Nahil, Nahas Agan and Nas Naslaike, it's a Yushin. Um, just saying that um, the state of, of Gaelic, uh, I suppose, is changing. There are lots of uh, very positive figures coming out for Gaelic. The, the number of um, youngsters learning is going up. But a lot of the, the older generations who have this great kind of wealth of, of, of language and you know, vocabulary and phrases and all these things, they, they are, uh, kind of, we're losing them. And the, we have to be very careful that the young ones have this, a great depth of, of, the, of the culture and understanding, and it's not just something that's in a classroom, and it's something that has to be part of the community, and uh, something that's used in the home, and uh, as part of everyday life, or else it won't, it won't survive. But what I was saying as well is that music in, you know, be it in, in, in Scottish Gaelic or in Irish Gaelic, um, I asked my question in Irish Gaelic, helps learners in, in Scotland and in Europe and in the world to understand the language, to understand the culture and to, to learn the languages too if you are so interested. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm German but I've learned Irish in Ireland and in Germany through music as well, mainly through conversation yeah. with, with people who I pass think, on the language, I think but there's also no through music. So I'm very grateful for oh. musicians making the words accessible. You have the words on your website for at we least We do, or and I mean, uh, so. you know, it's like doing a PhD every time I do an album, you know, it's like researching all the songs and, uh, you know, the word count for the new album booklet is five and a half thousand words of, uh, you know, of, of lyrics and stories and information. So it's... Uh, you know, you've had, we had to phone up the printers and they were saying, hmm, we'll have to have a widened spine for this one. Uh, so, I, but I guess that comes part and partial and it's, I'm very um, aware that when you put something like that in print, that it really needs to be correct because it's, it's there, do you know? And a lot of these songs have perhaps never been, well, maybe they've been written down before, but maybe never widely published or, you know, th things like that. Some of these songs are still very localized. So um, it's, it's important when you are writing them down that they're correct. It's an extra burden that nobody's ever thought about. But a wee bit. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Well, it, is, um, it is worth doing, though. And it thanks, is. And thanks for that. It is. And like when we did the last album, and it was like 32 pages and all that, I said, right, next time, I'm just going to say, see the website for lyrics. <laughs> and then when it came to it, I just couldn't bring myself to do that. I knew it had to be a, a better package than that. So, yeah. But it's appreciated, so there you yeah. go. So. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, Hi. If you could recommend a place in Scotland to visit, where would it be? Ooh, North Uist. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, if, a really unusual St Kilda, if oh. you could get out there. Um, I was lucky enough to go two years ago, um, three years ago, in, in 2011, and it was, uh, it was, it was, this sounds a bit dramatic, but it was almost life-changing. It was really incredible to be there, and uh, you really feel like you're on the edge of the world. It's, uh, it's an amazing place, yeah. But tricksy to get to, I would have thought. Then. Kinda. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Plan ahead for that one. Plan ahead <laughs> for that one. Um, I was going to ask you, the voice, not the TV series, but your voice is the is the mortgage payer. Do you have any rituals to look after it? I mean, I, I'm aware at Celtic Connections, seeing artists, just seem to spend all day talking to each other. Is there any point where you go, actually, I need to look after this now and stop talking and step back and, and yeah. look after it? What rituals do you have? Well, I guess I learned the hard way. I think in 2008, or was at the end of 2007, when we were recording our second album, I had kind of gone from not really, I'd gone from having a full-time job and doing a few gigs on the side to doing something like 150 gigs in the year or something. And funnily enough, with no training or anything, I, I kept losing my voice. And um, so I just kind of tried lots of things and learned slowly and I suppose the hard way, the, the best way is to, to look after your voice. And I try and do warm ups and lots of water, take honey. Um, and th the biggest thing is just behaving and going to bed when everybody else is not. <laughs> That's something like Celtic Connections, I find that very hard to believe. Um, biggest gig? Biggest gig. You've ever done? Um, probably. In terms of a, a viewing audience, probably the Ryder Cup, I suppose. Um, but uh, things like singing, even singing like Flow to Scotland at Hamden, that's always great crack. Yeah. And having, you know, tens of thousands of voices singing with you, that's nice. That's and really nice. Maybe the same answer, but the best gig you've ever done. The best gig? Um, that's a toughie. 
Um, the next one. The next one. Yeah. The next one. Yeah. I, d I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And 2014, new album. You've got Transatlantic Sessions tour coming up as well. Yes. Yes. Touring the album. Yes, that Another too. Busy um, year. Busy year. Uh, we've got Transatlantic Sessions starting next week. And uh, we'll be touring throughout the UK. And then we've got a show in Holland. Then I get a few days off and um, down to the Folk Awards after that in February in the Royal Albert Hall. Nice. Which is very um, and then because we don't have the same time anymore, we're just doing a select few shows to promote the album and then some festivals in the summer. And uh, of course, hopefully working with, with Nicola some more, Nicola Benedetti. So, yeah. Um, any more questions? Um, or I shall, one more. Oh, there's a man with a mic there. Hang on just one second. Hi, Jamie. Hi. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, what advice would you give to young musicians and singers who um, kind of want to follow in your footsteps, who want to promote Scottish culture and Scottish singing and music? What would you think the right steps would be to do that? Um, well, I guess the only thing I can, the only advice I can offer is a kind of a comparison to what, to what I have done. And I suppose that's just being true to the music that you want to, to play and getting out there and working hard, there's no shortcuts to it. And just, you know, like when we started out, you know, myself and the Dolchus, for example, the girls, we'd go out and we'd um, pack the car full of PA and then we'd drive like 150 miles to a hall in the Highlands and then we'd set up the PA and then we'd do our own sound check and then we'd do the gig and then we'd do a Kayleigh dance after the gig and then we'd take down the PA and then we'd all drive home. So, you know, that that's it's, it's a good work ethic, you know, it's good to start off and just do the work and trade the boards and uh, then just, you know, just try your best, I guess. It's a slog. Any more questions? Any more questions? I have one final question. Pineapples or elephants? Elephants. Elephants. Thank you very much. That's a question <laughs> we're set up for. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for staying tonight. And thank you very much, Julie Fowlis. Thank you.